Okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you can see, I uh, am afraid I come from the damage side of the things, to use the word of John Matonitz. I come from the regulation side. My name is Rita, uh, and I come from the, the European Banking Authority. I thank you very much for inviting me to this conference here. I have prepared a few slides to, to which I, I thought I'd develop the various points I would like to, to make. Given that I am speaking uh, on behalf of the European Banking Authority, it, it would come uh, not as a surprise for you that I would have a regulatory uh, perspective of virtual currencies, not as sexy as the topics we have been hearing about, I'm afraid, but um, this is uh, the entity I represent here. So I will, uh, before I go into the specificities of uh, virtual currencies, um, as a first use case for um, blockchain technology. I will spend a few minutes explaining who the EBA is, the legal instruments it can use and its scope of action. Uh, I will then explain why the EBA is interested in innovations and what approach we use when you, we analyze these innovations. And I will spend the remaining time, of course, on the specific case of, uh, of uh, virtual currencies. So uh, let's start with some introductory remarks to DBA. DBA um, was created on the 1st of January 2011 through a new regulation which defines our objectives, our tasks um, and our regulatory remit. Uh, it also means that we are celebrating our fifth anniversary this year. We had a conference also to celebrate this and we are celebrating ongoing because we are. We celebrate all year long. Um, so uh, we came into being on January uh, 2011 when it took over all existing uh, tasks and responsibilities from the Committee of European Banking Supervisors that existed before us. Uh, we took on additional tasks including consumer protection, the monitoring of financial innovation and payments. And this is exactly the unit I represent here, this is the, the unit I work for at TBA and this is the unit that dealt with virtual currencies when they came into our uh, radar in 2013. We are an independent authority. We are, however, accountable to the EU Parliament, to the Council, not to the European Commission. And we have as our highest body of decision, uh, the, B the BOS, the Board of Supervisors, um, which comprises the heads of the 28 national supervisory authorities. This is our building in Canary Wharf in London. Uh, rest assured, we don't occupy the whole building. We just occupy one floor and a half, not that big. So as for the main objective and mandate of the EBA, as, as I've told you, this is in our founding regulation. Um, in, the, in this regulation sets the boundaries of the things the EBA can and cannot do, as well as the means by which the EBA is meant to, to achieve its objective, which is to protect the public interest by contributing to the short, medium and long-term stability and effectiveness of the financial system for the union, the union economy, its citizens and businesses. And then we have a number of means by which we can um, actually achieve this objective. And I would like to draw your attention specifically to the last one, which is monitoring new and existing financial activities and adopting guidelines and recommendations with a view to promoting the safety and soundness of markets and convergence of regulatory practice. And it was uh, in the fulfillment of this mandate uh, that we um, analyze virtual currencies, and it is uh, on the fulfillment of this mandate that we analyze other uh, innovations that uh, we come across, such as, for instance, crowdfunding or the innovative um, ways uh, by which uh, financial institutions are now using consumer data, and we also discuss this here today. Regarding uh, the legal instruments available to DBA, a DBA's founding regulation has made available to DBA di different types of legal instruments, and you have them there uh, in the slide listed. Uh, they differ in terms of purpose, legal status, and possible addressees. Um, and I would like to briefly explain just the, four, um, the first four of them, because these are, they are the most um, uh, important ones. So technical standards. Um, would be uh, the legal instruments that are directly applicable union law, which means national competent authorities will have to apply them without doing anything uh, in their um, own uh, jurisdiction. So we issue these, uh, these um, technical standards and they are directly applicable in the national competent authorities um, uh, state. DBA uh, can only issue them if they had been explicitly mandated by the European Commission and code legislators to do so. So we cannot do them on our own initiative. Then we have uh, guidelines, and guidelines are not uh, directly applicable union law as opposed to uh, our uh, technical standards. And once the EBA has issued them, the national authorities will still need to implement them into national law, 
um, by any means they found reasonable. They find reasonable. Guidelines can be addressed to national authorities or to financial um, institutions. And the EBA may issue guidelines because it has an explicit mandate in the level one text to do so, or because uh, by its own initiative we decide to do so. Uh, national authorities have the option of non -co not complying with the EBA guidelines, even though they are mandatory, but if they don't comply, they have to explain why. So we call this the complain, um, <laughs> comply, not complain, comply or explain mechanism. Then we have opinions and warnings, and these are the most important instruments for financial innovation. Uh, these, these were the, the ones that we have used before for, for virtual currencies and crowdfunding. Opinions uh, are legally non-binding requirements or views of the EBA, which the EBA can address to national authorities or to the co-legislators, that is the, the European Commission, Parliament and Council, but we cannot address opinions to financial institutions. The EBA may produce them uh, because it has been explicitly mandated to do so in level one uh, regulation or based on its own initiative. Warnings are means uh, by which the EBA communicates with consumers mainly. So not with the national computer authorities, not with the co-legislators to consumers. And we tend to use really plain and simple language. And we have issued one uh, on virtual currencies in 2013. As to the EBA scope of action, um, the EBA regulatory remit is defined uh, by the EU directives and regulations that fall in, into its scope of action. So we cannot act on anything that we see or that we would like to act upon. We have to act within our scope of action. And our scope of action is either in our founding regulation that I've told you about or in uh, any one of these uh, directives. But uh, what I would really like to draw your attention to is uh, that given its scope of action, the EBA's innovation work focuses on topics and topics such as the payment services, payment accounts, electronic money, mortgages, personal loans and deposits. And this is what we usually call banking products, even though we know nowadays banks are not the only actors in the financial world anymore. But uh, these are the products that we care about. This, uh, this is where we look for innovation. So now to tell you uh, a bit about DBA's work on virtual currencies. Uh, virtual currencies emerged on DBA's radar in 2013, like I told you, uh, but by then virtual currencies such as bitcoins had already uh, been in existence for two years or so, as you are well aware. Um, on autumn that year, DBA became aware of the increasing use of virtual currencies by consumers as a means for paying goods or services, and this was our main uh, concern, so uh, virtual currencies being used as means of payments, because as I told you, we are a payments regulator. Um, and this evolution of virtual currencies uh, was of interest to us. So we did an initial assessment of only three months, and uh, after this we issued a warning to consumers uh, in December 2013, making them aware of the many risks to which they are exposed when using virtual currencies as a means of payment. And we have included things as price vol volatility, absence of consumer rights for reimbursement if the entity um, goes bankrupt, for instance, um, and the risk of seizure by law enforcement agencies. The warning uh, was uh, published in our website at the time and um, circulated to uh, national computer authorities as well. What was left unaddressed at the time was the question whether or not virtual currencies should be regulated as such. So we did a further assessment um, and in um, July 2014, we issued an opinion to the, Europe the European Commission, Council and Parliament as well to our national competent authorities regarding virtual currencies and it is the content of this opinion that I would like to tell you a little bit more about. Before that, I will tell you uh, just how we go about our innovation work, because I think it's important for you to understand how we, as a regulator, see innovation. And we have an interest in ensuring that actors participating in innovative market segments can have confidence in doing so. So in order to achieve this, DBA tends to assess the benefits and risks of the innovation and to, uh, with a view to determine which, if any, regulatory action uh, should be taken. And this is very important because we don't start the assessment or the analysis with a view to, regul to regulating. We don't think about, oh, let's regulate this innovation, it needs regulation. No, we see the benefits, we see the risks, and we do a balance and we do this analysis with our national computer authorities to see uh, if any action is actually required. 
when we do so, uh, we try to trade off, of course, our, our concerns about risks against the interests uh, in harnessing the potential benefits or allowing the market to harness these benefits. So we take several steps when analyzing um, innovation, and you have them there. So we first characterize innovation. We tell what we see. Then we identify the various types of market participants. We always identify potential benefits of this activity. Then we go about the risks. We try to prioritize them. And then we identify what are the causes for such risks. We then assess if there is a already a legislation or regulation that addresses the risks we have identified. And then um, we see if, if there is indeed a need for additional regulatory and or supervisory measures. And assess, we assess the extent to which there is the need of a consistent uh, EU approach, because it may as well be that even though there is regulation and even though regulation is needed, it can be done or it should be better done at national level and not by DBA at an European level. So in our opinion on virtual currencies that we issued in July 2014, we have tried to characterize or to define virtual currencies on the basis of what we saw in the market by then. Um, and we have characterized virtual currencies as a digital representation of a value that is uh, not issued by a central bank, not by a public authority of any kind. It's not necessarily attached to a fiat currency, but it is accepted by natural legal persons as a means of exchange, a means of payment and it can be transferred, stored, or traded electronically. In their decentralized variant, uh, which is the case of Bitcoins, of course, these are the most interesting ones, virtual schemes tend to be created online using computer hardware, which allows users to mine virtual currencies units by solving complex but otherwise useless algorithms. <laughs> this is provocative, huh? Um, the increase in the supply of virtual currencies units is said to be fixed by a mathematical protocol, preventing future increases in supply. And this is something uh, we have heard about um, as well today. Um, virtual currencies uh, transactions are validated by miners. They operate anonymously, of course, from anywhere in the world, and are recorded on the distributed le on the public ledger that um, is called blockchain for the purposes of Bitcoin. They, uh, virtual currencies are held in personalized accounts known as e-wallets, from which they can be sent to anyone in the world willing to accept them. And then, as I told you, we, we have tried to identify the market participants. This is what we saw. We saw users of virtual currencies, merchants accepting them, exchanges changing them for uh, fiat currencies, wallet providers, and technical service providers and information providers of uh, some kind. So as I told you, we have tried to assess the potential benefits of uh, virtual currencies uh, to consumers and also to financial institutions. Uh, and this is, these are the most important uh, benefits that we saw. In reduction in transaction costs, um, virtual currencies are said to bring about um, reduction in transaction costs when compared to traditional means of payment, such as, for instance, credit transfers or card payments. The cost advantage would primarily be due to the absence of financial intermediary, as well as the absence of exchange fees in cross-border transactions that are almost um, close to zero. However, in our assessment, we have found that um, this, this uh, benefit is uh, difficult to confirm for the EU market, because, uh, as you are aware, um, there are initiatives, and we have discussed them as well today, such as the Single Euro Payment Area, the SEPA, uh, where um, there is a significant reduction in transaction costs. And this is also valid for the next uh, benefit, the reduction of transaction processing time. We also discussed this here today. So what we saw um, as DBA is an European regulator was that in the European market, uh, some of these benefits might not be so expressive as it could be the case out, outside Europe, because there are certain projects um, harmonizing projects within the European Union that make, for instance, transaction costs and processing time uh, very reduced. What we have seen, though, is a contribution to economic growth, and we can validate this, um, we can actually acknowledge this, this benefit, because uh, virtual currency ex schemes have offered various new business opportunities. For example, the activity of mining um, has spawned development of specialized mining hardware, specialized server farms, commercial mining services. So there is a lot of, uh, there is a, a lot of offer of services uh, or, and products attached to virtual currencies, and we see uh, this contribution to the economic grow growth. Uh, financial inclusion, um, one more time, uh, is a 
a, a valid uh, benefit that is very much uh, talked about when, it, when we talk about virtual currencies. But in Europe, we don't see it as uh, very relevant because, as you know, in Europe, um, the, the numbers for financial inclusion are not as low as they are, as, as they are in the other parts of uh, the world. We then saw, uh, as well as a potential benefit, the security of personal data because, um, as you know, um, unlike, unlike credit cards or other, other means of payment, you don't have to provide any type of personal data when you use virtual currencies to do your transactions. So there is the security of, of personal data. But uh, this alleged benefit comes also uh, at a price uh, because, as I will explain in the next slide, virtual currencies allow individuals, um, entities, and even jurisdictions to transact money um, anonymously. And this uh, may give rise to numerous risks related to money laundering, uh, financial crime, and terrorist financing. These are the risks. <laughs> and, uh, okay, you are not supposed to be able to read this. This is just to show you um, that we have identified a lot of risks, of course. Um, but what I, what I want to draw your attention to is the colors. So um, we have tried, as I told you, we have tried to prioritize the risks. And the green indicates risks for which DBA believes that no regulatory mitigation is required. For example, because they can be left to market participants to address. Red indicates risks that definitely require mitigation such as the risks uh, on the top right uh, of the table, which are those related to financial crime, terrorist financing, and anti-money laundering. And yellow indicates risks that are likely to require mitigation, but require further analysis. Uh, we have covered also several categories of risks, and there were risks to users, such as security, fraud, lack of protection in case of failure, risks to non-user market participants, such as those to merchants accepting virtual currencies, uh, are also risks to financial integrity, such as money laundering, financial crime, and terrorist financing. Risks to payment systems and payment service providers, but in fiat currency, because, uh, for example, that could, there could be a spillover effects from transactions in virtual currencies to those in fiat currencies. And risks to ourselves as regulatory authorities, because um, we are on the hook either way. Either we regulate and we don't regulate in the right way, or we don't regulate, and it's because we don't regulate that things go wrong. As I also told you about our method, we have, we have tried to identify the causes of the risks. And um, also, you are not supposed to, to read all of this. I will not go through them. But I would like to, um, to mention the first two of these risk drivers. The first one relates to the fact that a virtual currency scheme can be created by anyone and uh, anonymously so. Um, and the functioning of the scheme can subsequently also be changed again anonymously. This is because of the so-called 51% attack. So this is what we, what we call a 51% attack. It's a, um, if a pool of miners at some time manages to obtain 51% of the transaction power uh, used to mine virtual currencies, they will have the power to block virtual currencies, to change the protocol, to, um, to change the functioning of the scheme, basically. So when the EBA carried out this work, um, we tried to uh, have a dialogue with the supporters of virtual currencies to understand more about this particular characteristic. And we heard from uh, numerous parties that it was very difficult that such a 51% uh, attack would uh, actually occur. But the fact is uh, that a um, few days before we issued the opinion, this, this actually happened. So a pool of miners actually had the power to change the protocol, only they didn't, and they were very clear, and they anonymous, anonymously uh, declared to the world that they wouldn't change the protocol, but they could if they wanted to. So um, we as a regulator, we have seen lots of bad things happen in the past, and so we do not hold such assurances in too high uh, esteem. So the messages we are conveying in our, in our EB opinion remain highly relevant, we think. The second causal driver uh, I would like to mention relates to the fact that virtual uh, schemes, virtual currency schemes allow peer-to-peer -peer transactions that are anonymous. And this undermines the ability of, gov of governments to impose financial sanctions on individuals, organizations, or entire jurisdictions. This is because the sanctions are imposed by uh, disallowing, for instance, financial intermediaries to carry out certain transactions. But in virtual currency transactions, there are no intermediaries, so there is no one to sanction. 
it's not that the EBA uh, has a view on the desirability of having uh, sanctions, but um, they are very, very useful and a very powerful tool for national competent authorities, and we work with our national competent authorities. So we do have to, to recognize that the link between virtual currencies and sanctions is a, a very first order question that needs to be addressed before the EBA starts to think about regulating virtual currencies. So we have tried to address the, the risk drivers and we have tried to put in place a regulatory approach that would be required uh, to um, mitigate all the risks we have identified. And this is a potential uh, regulatory approach for the long term. And you can find it in the opinion. I won't, I won't go through that. Um, I would just like to focus on one of uh, these, uh, um, this, this list here, uh, which is the first one. And this has to do with the existence of a scheme governance authority for each virtual currency scheme. So the, this authority would have to be a private sector entity and, and would have to be accountable to the regulators for the prospering, functioning and integrity of the scheme. Because for a payments regulator as EBA is, it is not simply conceivable to accept the scenario, the scenario that the, um, governance, um, the, the governance can be changed in the meantime, that 51% attack can occur and a number of people can change the rules uh, while the process is ongoing. So we have to make sure that there is a scheme authority, an independent one, a private one, that would ensure that the rules are there, they are to be um, abide by and uh, they need to be um, there. It does not mean that the virtual currencies would be uh, required to be issued centrally. This is not the case. We do not aim for a centralized virtual currency scheme. We, we are aware that this is completely contrary to, to what we see today. They can continue to be issued and mined decentralized. Uh, but the scheme governance authority would be required to ensure that this 51% attack could not occur. We were aware that uh, the long-term um, regulatory response was very difficult to obtain. And so, in our opinion, we suggested um, a regulatory response to um, happen in the meantime. And what we, so we, as, like, like I told you, we have addressed our opinion to the national computer authorities and to the EU legislators. So we, to the national computer authorities, we have told them um, not to buy, hold, or sell virtual currencies. We have tried to build a wall, if you, if you may say so, between the regulated financial world and the unregulated financial world. And we have said that, okay, innovation can occur, innovation can continue to occur, virtual currency schemes can still be there, we are not prohibiting them, uh, only we are trying to protect, as far as we can, the regulated financial uh, entities. And we have also told uh, the EU legislators that they should consider declaring virtual currency exchangers as obliged entities under the anti-money laundering directive, which would require them to comply with anti-money laundering uh, rules. Ah, this is just a, a funny way of uh, telling you how we... So we used uh, Google as an, an adopted non-conclusive evidence, of course, on the public interest of, of virtual currencies. And it appears to have picked around the time the EBA published its warning and opinion on virtual currencies. We had to see this. Um, it have tapered off since then, uh, but still continues, of course, to show uh, lower, but still very consistent uh, high research frequency. So just to give you um, a short update of what's going on in the European world about virtual currencies, we see the European legislators show growing interest in virtual currencies. This has uh, uh, been um, also uh, touched upon uh, this morning, um, but I can tell you that the European Council has reacted to the terrorist attacks in Paris by inviting the European Commission to strengthen controls, controls of non-banking payment methods, and among those are virtual currencies. We then have the European Commission, who, have, who has presented an action plan to strengthen the fight attacks um, against the financing of terrorism, in which it conveys its intention to tackle uh, terrorist financing re uh, risks linked to virtual currencies and to develop further uh, requirements, and they should be related to the Anti-Money Laundering di Directive and also to the Payment Services Directive that has just been approved. And we have also the European Parliament who has just published a draft report on virtual currencies whereby it recommends the review of the legislation on payments, such as the two uh, directives I've just told you about. Just to end, and I would like to make um, that a hook with the blockchain technology. So what, what I said up until now was our view of um, blockchain technology 
when used for virtual currencies, because as a payments regulator, this was our concern, uh, virtual currencies being used as a means of payment. But since the EBA published its uh, opinion in July 2014, the interest has uh, shifted from the narrow focus on virtual currencies uh, towards blockchain technology itself and other distributed ledgers. Um, and we have seen, of course, other promising use cases of the technology, such as um, smart contracts, which we have just heard about. And I would like to tell you that for the EBA, this shift in focus is a promising development as the, these new use cases seem to avoid one of the key risks that the EBA um, has previously identified, which is the 51% attack, because um, the new emerging use cases appear to revert to modified variants of blockchain technology that seem to tackle this risk through, for instance, permissioned ledgers. Uh, and this, these uh, permissioned ledgers would be ledgers where participation uh, is restricted to a set of authorized parties, parties which have to go through an authentication process. And this would be, um, for a payments regulator like TBA, um, a step towards uh, more accountability in the payment scheme and more um, clarity. So I guess I would like to end with a question to the audience. So I'd like to, to understand from you if you think that adapting blockchain would allow for more accountability and prevent some of the risks we have identified in the past. <laughs>